Emily is the member of the family who was least well adapted to living away from home. She was someone who lived completely in her own mind, and so she found it very difficult to cope with the realities of the world outside the parsonage. So whenever she tried to take a job elsewhere as a governess or a teacher, she found that she became so homesick that she physically endangered her own health and had to come back here. The real world was never as important to her as her own world created in her head. Emily loved the mall with its loneliness, but she never minded household duties either and was eager to help her aunt and Tabby. She was sent to bake the best bread in Haworth. She used to learn German words while preparing the dough, just as her father had read books by the loom many years before. Anne and Emily used to keep an odd birthday notebook together in which they summarized all the events that were important to them every four years. Anne Bronte was always overshadowed by her sisters. Very little is actually known about her except that she was gentle and pretty and loved the scene. Her heroines, Agnes Gray and Helen Huntingdon, the tenant of Wildfield Hall, both flee to the sea. Agnes Gray could hardly bear the mortification she was exposed to as a governess. Helen was trying to escape from a brutal and drunken husband. The men who make Anne's heroine suffer are always men from the upper ranks of society. Anne went to Scarborough several times. The last time she went there, knowing that she was suffering from consumption, she hoped that the healthy air of the North Sea would alleviate the disease. She died four days after her arrival. In her posthumous biographical notice, Charlotte described her sister as a person of mild, steady patience, a very sincere and practical Christian. It is true that Anne's willingness to suffer unbelievable humiliations as a governess in strange households was uncommon. Until the present day, her precise descriptions of the shady side of middle and upper class moral standards have been underrated. Everybody always says that Charlotte Bronte created the whole idea of a plain heroine in Jane Eyre and that she was the innovator in the family. But it was actually Anne Bronte who wrote Agnes Grey, who is very much a plain heroine, long before Charlotte had put pen to paper to write Jane Eyre. So Anne was quite bold in putting forward literary theories. And in The Tenant of Wildfell Hall, which is an extraordinary story, of, of drunkenness and of a woman leaving her husband, she put forward all sorts of ideas that really shocked Victorian society at the time. But she did it because she believed it was right. And when she believed something was right, she would stick to it. And, and so she had this great, I think, power of endurance and a power of putting things forward when she thought things were morally right. Never shall I, Charlotte Bronte, forget what a voice of wild and wailing music now came thrillingly to my mind's, almost to my body's ear, nor how distinctly I saw, sitting in the schoolroom at Rowhead, the Duke of Zamorna, gleaming against that obelisk with the mute victory above him, and the African sky quivering and shaking with stars expanded above all. I was quite gone. I had really utterly forgot where I was and all the gloom and cheerlessness of my situation. I felt myself breathing quick and short 
as I beheld as a mourner lifting up his sable crest, which undulated as the plume of a hearse waves to the wind, and knew that the music was exciting him and quickening his ever rapid pulse. Miss Bronte, what are you thinking about? said a voice that dissipated all the charm, and Miss Lister thrust her little rough black head into my face. Sick transit. Lord Byron could have been the inspiration for this. His work and his scandal-ridden life had inspired the imagination of the Brontes since their very early years. Zamorna, the Duke of Zamorna, was Charlotte's great romantic creation. She invented him when she was about 12 years old, and he was literally one of the toy soldiers in a box that Branwell, her brother, had been given as a birthday present. But gradually, over the years, she evolved his character. He became the great love interest of her stories, dashing and romantic and handsome, every teenage girl's dream. But Charlotte remained absolutely obsessed with him, to the point where she could actually visualize him. She would be you know, sitting there writing, and suddenly he would appear before her. And you get this sense when you're reading Charlotte's of accounts of this happening, that she's absolutely terrified by the power of her own imagination. It's as though she's losing her own grip on reality. And you can see that quite clearly she would be looking at Emily Bronte, her sister, and thinking that Emily had gone too far that way, that the imaginary world had become too real for her, and that perhaps the same thing was happening to Charlotte herself. Charlotte was 26 when she went on her first long journey. She went to Brussels, accompanied by her father and her sister Emily. She and her sister had decided to go to school again, though. Their aunt had supported her niece's costly project in order to give them a sound grounding for the future. However, what at first appeared to be a delightful and exciting adventure turned out to be a difficult undertaking. The two shy daughters of a clergyman could not foresee the problems they would be faced with in faraway Belgium. When their aunt died unexpectedly, they interrupted their schooling. Charlotte went on her second journey across the channel without Emily, who was utterly determined never to leave Haworth again. Charlotte was to continue her studies of French in Madame Eger's boarding school and to teach the other girls English. She suffered from the vanity of the other girls and the undisguised condescension with which they treated her. The reason why she suffered all this stoically was a man. Constantin Eger, the husband of the principal of the school, encouraged her in her studies and in doing so kindled the greatest passion in Charlotte that she was ever to feel throughout her life. She immortalized him in two novels, The Professor and Villette. In these she describes her ideal of an almost pedagogic love. The lover is the professor who educates the much younger and much less educated girl and raises her to his own mental level. Of course, the Azures became aware of Charlotte's passion. They tried to draw back and keep themselves at a distance from Charlotte. She could not stand the situation any longer and found a pretext to flee back to England. The journey home took three days. At home, the entire family had assembled to celebrate Christmas together. But shortly after, Anne and Brenwell had to return to their places of work. And Charlotte, in her despair, remained at home with Emily and her father. She did not even find comfort in what had formerly been her favorite occupation, writing. The hero of her youth, Zamora, had become a reality in the form of Professor Azure. She did not dare confide in her sister or her best friend, she was quite alone with her heartbreak. She plucked up courage and wrote to Brussels. Haworth, 8th January, 1845. Day and night find I neither rest nor peace. If I sleep, I have tormenting dreams in which I see you always severe, always saturnine and angry with me. Forgive me then, monsieur, if I take the step of writing to you again. 
How can I bear my life unless I make an effort to alleviate its sufferings?